important things that happen on mountaintops. We even speak of some of these as mountaintop experiences. Remember back in the Old Testament on Mount Sinai, God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. He later manifested his presence in the fire and the storm as God gave Israel his law through Moses. We're also reminded that on Mount Carmel, God answered Elijah's prayer to send down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, to consume the entire altar which was drenched and in with water, thus defeating all the prophets of Baal. On another high mountain, our Lord Jesus Christ, he defeated Satan, who attempted our Lord by showing him all the glories of all the kingdoms of the world, saying, you know, you can have it all. It's the easy way, without the cross, just, just bow down and worship me, Satan said. And Jesus, quoting scripture, said, and you must worship the Lord your God only, and him only shall you serve. And today we come to another mountain top. The Mount of Transfiguration, where these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they have a mountaintop experience. They get to be eyewitnesses of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through beholding the glory of the Lord that we and they are forever changed. So here's our outline for us this morning. We have the Transfiguration, Peter's foolish suggestion, the cloud of glory, and the treatment of Elijah. And our goal is that you would see the glory of Christ in his gospel and in his word so that you may live faithfully and obedient to him with faithful anticipation of what you'll be one day in glory. Let's look at the transfiguration there in verse 1. So after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Now remember, you know, Jesus is up north in the northern Israel near Caesarea Philippi, kind of the northernmost part of the land. And after six days, which is actually the same amount of time that uh, Moses was up with God in Mount Sinai would be when he saw the glory of the Lord. So there's this kind of parallelism between Jesus and Moses here. But we're also reminded that this transfiguration takes place within a week of the passage from the previous message, last passage, chapter 16. Last week, you remember where Peter rebuked Jesus, saying, Lord, may it never be. And then Jesus has to rebuke Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your things on the minds of God, but on the, the mind of man. Tempting Jesus to get glory without suffering. And he reminded us that the way of the cross is that you must deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow Jesus. You cannot be saved and, and have life, eternal life, any other way. It also reminded us that our soul was worth more than everything in the entire world. And that you will have glory one day in heaven for your faithfulness to follow and obey Christ. And that very last part there, you know, Jesus reminded them, some of you here, talking to his disciples, will not see death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And immediately we have in our text, you know, here, the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, the mount where this takes place is actually unknown. There's kind of three main suggestions. There's Mount Tabor, uh, which is about 20 kilometers from the Sea of Galilee, but it was not really a high mountain, only about 1,900 feet in elevation, kind of like a hill. But there's also a Roman garrison or a fortress on top, so most people think this is not exactly where it is. It's too far away from where Jesus was in order to get there in six days, so not a private place either. There's also Mount Hermon, which was where they were just at, and just north of Caesarea Philippi, a really high mountain, 9,300 some square feet, uh, feet in elevation. It's where Jesus is, but it's also kind of bordering Israelite and, and, and Gentile territory. And this is kind of problematic for people because as Jesus descends down, uh, Mark's gospel tells us, you know, Jews met him, the religious leaders met him, and we might be asking, well, where did they come from if this is so far away from uh, Galilee, so far away from Jerusalem. There's a third mountain that it could be. Mount Miran, the highest elevation in Israel itself, 3,900 square feet, just northwest of Galilee, and it kind of seems to fit because it's halfway between Caesarea Philippi and Capernaum, where Jesus is heading towards. So, you know, it could be any one of these mountains. You can take your pick. We don't really know for certain which one it is. But it's more important what happens on the mountain than exactly, you know, the physical location 
of the mountain. So Peter, James, and John, these three disciples, they are called by Jesus to go up to the mountaintop to pray, according to Luke's gospel. These three are the closest in intimacy with Jesus, the ones who are the, the vocal leaders amongst the group of disciples. It's also important that there are three because according to Jewish law, in order to, have, you know, to verify testimony of a witness, there had to be three or two or three reliable witnesses to, to have a court session. And these three men are eyewitnesses of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now the disciples, they already knew who, that Jesus was, was more than just a man. They saw the miracles. They, they saw his power over creation. They knew that he had power over demons, power to heal all kinds of incurable diseases, power to feed tens of thousands of people, power over nature to walk on water, to command the storm, to command the wind, and they obey him. They saw that Jesus, this man, was doing all these miracles. They've seen that for two and a half years. But what they're about to see on this mountaintop blows all of that away. They get to see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in all his unveiled glory. Look with me in verse 2. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes were, uh, became white as light. And this word here, transfigured, is the word we have translated for metamorphosis in, in English. And this word describes what we would see in a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, transforming into a butterfly. It's not just a surface change, but it's a radical internal change that affects the whole being. Paul even uses this uh, word, uh, metamorphosis, to describe how a Christian is spiritually transformed when we're saved. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed, that word metamorphosized, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. He also says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we, with all unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorphosized into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So Jesus here was completely changed from having being Jesus the man to now Jesus being the glorified son of God, face shining like the sun, clothes becoming as white as light, as if Jesus himself was being clothed with the thunder and glory of, and the majesty of heaven itself. He went from one moment looking like a normal man to now looking like the divine son of God. The flesh, the body that was veiling his glory was for but that a moment, momentarily removed. And Peter, James, and John, they got to see the unveiled glory of Christ. Now you and I will all one day, if we're in Christ, we will be taken up to heaven. We will see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of heaven, the glory of God. But these men, they got to see the glory of Christ while still living, and they continue to live. The Apostle John will get to see the glory of God again one day. As you remember, you know, he is on that island, exiled in Patmos. He receives a heavenly vision of the throne room of God. And, and, we, and we have that recorded down for us in the book of Revelation. And the glory of Christ is so radiant and bright that there will be no more need for any sun or moon or any stars in the heaven. There will be no more darkness because the glory of the risen land will illuminate all the new heavens and the new earth. That's the picture we have received from scripture. Now there's another person who was able to experience and see the glory of God too. Remember back in Exodus with Moses, he requested, Lord, just show me your glory. Show me your glory, Moses said. And, and, and God said, no, no man can see my glory and live. But this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to put you in, in, in the cleft of the rock so that as I walk by, you may see you know, a glimpse, the back of my back, the, of the glory. And through that, you know, even though Moses only saw the back of God, he was so transformed that Moses' face became so radiant and bright that all the people, as they saw him coming down the mountain, they fled with terror. We see this, you know, radiating light of face falling down. So, so he had to cover his face just for them with a cloth. 
In that time, Moses, he was reflecting the glory of God like a mirror. But what the disciples saw, they full, saw the full glory of God himself and the glory of Jesus Christ. And given what they witnessed that day, it's not a surprise that you see them turning the world upside down. But they remained faithful to him to take the gospel to the very ends of the earth. You know, bearing their cross to the very end of their lives for most of them. Peter would write about this moment again many decades later in his epistles. We'll get to that later. But the lesson I want to encourage you with is that the more we behold the glory of Christ, the more we will be changed into his likeness. The more we'll be motivated for service. Just looking upon Christ, seeing his splendor and wonder changes how we think, changes how we feel, changes how we live and how we worship how we view life. Now, you may not ever have a mountaintop experience like what the disciples experienced here or like what Moses had. Very few people ever have. But you can behold the glory of Christ every time you open up your word, every time you open up the Bible. You look for Christ, beholding his glory, meditating upon the gospel, meditating upon the cross. You can behold the glory of Christ in your life be changed more and more into his likeness so after jesus unveiled his glory to the disciples verse 3 behold there appeared to them moses and elijah talking with jesus now moses here who represents the law he is the lawgiver elijah represents the prophets you know the great miracle worker the great miracle working prophet reformer of the people remember he was the one who was taken up to god to heaven in a chariot of fire he never died Together, Moses and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, they make up the Old Testament, which prophesies and reveals through many symbols and many metaphors and even types that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who would have to suffer and die for his people. I mean, think about it. The whole sacrificial system, the whole necessity to have a Passover lamb to die in your place, that's a picture of Jesus, obviously. We know that. All these laws about ritual cleansing and purity show us that in order for God to receive us, we must be holy and pure, like he is pure. All these laws given about the Levitical priesthood tell us that we need a holy intercessor to bring us back to God, because we all stray. All the prophets, you know, we see in all these prophecies that there would be a future glorious kingdom of God where this Messiah would come and reign and sit on David's throne forever and ever and rule in righteousness. He would be born of a virgin and suffer and die at the hands of sinful people. Like all this contained in our Old Testament. In essence, you know, having these two figures, Moses and Elijah, coming together, you know, to talk to Jesus, they're saying, you know, whatever we said, whatever we spoke, whatever we wrote, whatever we hoped for, whatever we longed for, it is all fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is the glorious Son of God. But as we get to verse 4, we see that Peter can't just sit quietly and just marvel and enjoy the moment. He has to ruin it all. He has to open up his big mouth and say something. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is, is, is it good that we are here? If we wish, I will make... Three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, to us, it seems like a very strange question. Why does Peter want to make these three tents or these three tabernacles for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah? Um, I guess maybe it's, it's around the same time when they would, the Jews would hold to celebrate the festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. This was a seven-day festival that took place around that time in, in October. Um, it, 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 they would you know, put up these booths temporary dwelling place to celebrate the exodus from slavery to Egypt and to celebrate you know, them entering to the promised land. Now, we're not really told why did you know, Peter come up with this, what was his motivation. We presume that Peter wants to remember this event. He wants to prolong this transfiguration experience, even setting up here some temporary dwellings, some temporary shrines to commemorate this holy place. 
Maybe he was even hoping that, oh, you are now here in your glory, Lord. You have come in glory. You don't have to go to the cross. Just stay the way you are and everything will be fine. But if we take a deeper look at what Peter's idea was, it was incredibly foolish. Even wrong-headed. And there's one big problem with it is that Peter was treating Moses and Elijah on equal grounds with Jesus himself. Now, Moses and Elijah are the great and righteous godly men in, in, the, in the Old Testament. But they, too, must bow the knee to worship Jesus Christ as Lord. They, too, need Jesus Christ to die for their sins. See, there's only one Son of God. There's only one that we worship. Not two, not three. All the glory, all the honor, all the majesty belongs to Jesus Christ alone. By the way, we also don't worship saints whether it's old testament saints or new testament saints we don't venerate saints or pray to saints for this reason and before peter can finish with this great idea the voice of god comes the god the father speaks through the cloud verse 5 saying you know, behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased listen to him this is the same cloud of glory that appeared to Moses, spoke to Moses. Later on, as you remember, you know, blocked the path of the Egyptians from you know, chasing them at the Red Sea so that the Israelites would all cross and make it to the other side. This is the same cloud of glory that led the people of Israel through the wilderness every day by day, that pillar of cloud. The crowd, you know, the, what that filled the tabernacle, you know, representing the, the physical manifestation of God, God's presence. The same cloud that filled later Solomon's temple and dwelled there in the holies of holies. The same cloud also spoke at Jesus' baptism, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. But this time, you know, he, the voice of God adds one more command. Listen to him. Listen to him. And you can't just help but think, you know, what is God the Father trying to tell Peter, who's being interrupted here? He's telling Peter, you got to be quiet. Shut your mouth. Just stop offering all your foolish ideas. Instead, just stand there and listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Especially when he's telling you what his plan is. That my plan is to send my son into the world to go to the cross for you. Don't try to present your alternatives. Don't try to alter his plan and tell us that you have a better one. Listen to him. Listen to him when he says that he must suffer and he must die at the hands of the religious leaders. Listen to him when he tells you that you too must take up your cross. If you want to see glory, you want to join me in the glory, you too must take up your cross. And all these things that Moses and Elijah point to and prophesy about Jesus, even though they are also present there, it's more important that you listen to Jesus, who speaks the very word of God. As we know from John 1, he himself is the incarnate word of God. You know, for all of us here, believers need to listen to Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus. Now, of course, there are many you know, duties and Christian responsibilities we have. There seems like there's always an endless amount of things to do, and there always are. It is more important for us to really to stand firm on the truth of Scripture and just listen to Jesus rather than to be so busy with countless activities. To listen to Jesus. To feed your own soul. To strengthen yourself in the word of God. Like you can't really, you can do a lot of things, but if you yourself are not being fed and hearing Jesus, your ministry will not accumulate to very much. Jesus is telling us, you know, it's better to hear and listen to the Son of God than it is to see visions of saints, than it is to build a, a place of worship. This is something that I need to take to heart myself too, right? That I cannot be 
the kind of father God wants me to be. I cannot be the kind of husband God wants to be. I cannot be the kind of pastor God wants me to be if I'm not listening to Jesus and focusing on his word and growing my own heart. So how do we listen to Jesus? Are we to search for some still, small voice within us? Try to navigate, you know, what's going on within here? Well, no, because that's mysticism. That's looking for truth from within. Trying to navigate through your subjective feelings on what, and then navigate through your experiences and try to find truth from within yourself. No, when we listen to Jesus, we are to listen to the word of God. Every time the word of God is read, every time the word of God is, is faithfully explained and proclaimed, this is Jesus really speaking to you. And do you have the ears to hear? Do you have what it takes to listen and hear him and obey him? And do you hear Jesus? Do you obey Christ? Or are you perhaps caught up in many of the theories and opinions of man? Caught up in even many, you know, perhaps good Christian activities that you really miss what is really needed. That we need to listen to Jesus and obey his word. In verse 6, you know, the disciples, when they heard the voice of God, they fell on their faces. They were terrified. Now, we could say, you know, they, the same word here is for reverence or worship, but I think context here, ESV has it right. They fell on their face, prostrate on the floor, filled with terror. A very common experience. Anytime you see any, you know, saints, any Old Testament saint, New Testament saint, when they see an angel, they see the glory of God, they're on the face, on the floor, thinking they're, they're dead. And they remain there on the floor until Jesus, you know, touches them and says, rise, have no fear. And as they open, you know, as he raises them up and they lift up their eyes, they see nobody there. Moses and Elijah are gone. It's almost as if to say, this is the one, the one that you see here, Jesus, is the one you must look to and listen to. Moses and Elijah, all they do is point to him, the, and he is the fullness. He is the one they're all uh, guiding everyone towards. So we get to verse 9, we see this interesting question, you know, this treatment of Elijah. So as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commands them very firmly, saying, Tell no one about this vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Now, of course, telling people about the glory of Christ, the transfigured Christ, that would just create all the, and, and propagate all the wrong messianic expectations for a political messiah. They can't tell anybody until after Christ has died and gone to the cross and be resurrected. Then you can go tell everybody what Christ has come to do for you. This is the second time that Jesus tells his disciples that I will die and I will be raised again. And it seems like these disciples are like my children. They have selective hearing. They don't really listen to this part where Jesus tells them the Son of Man is going to be raised again from the dead. And I can, you can imagine just how hard this would be for Peter, James, and John to keep this a secret. Especially Peter, who's always, you know, talking with his mouth, labyrinth without a filter. And you can picture them, you know, they're walking down, they're, they're, they're going from wherever the Mount of Transfiguration is, going to Capernaum, and they're asking one another, so what do you guys do on the Mount of Transfiguration? Right? What do we need to say? Like, I guess they have to give a white lie or something, saying, no, nothing, I didn't do anything. We just, we just went up to the mountaintop and prayed, right, James, right, John? And I think maybe to get out of this awkward conversation, we have verse 10. The disciples asked Jesus, then why did the scribes say first that, you, that Elijah must come? Let's change the topic. And this is actually a good question, a good spiritually minded question. Because from their perspective, they just saw Elijah. And, you know, from their limited perception, Elijah came after Jesus. I mean, they also have Malachi 4, 6, which says, remember the law that my servant Moses, the statues and the rules that I commanded him had horror for all Israel. For behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the father to their children, to the hearts of their children, to their father. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So this Elijah was going to come and, and re reform the people to avert destruction of the nation of Israel. 
And they're trying to piece together, how are all these events going to happen in this messianic age? Now, how does the death and resurrection of Jesus fit in with the, the coming of Elijah, who's supposed to come before the day of the Lord, and before the Messiah to restore all things? And they just witnessed Elijah came afterwards from their perception. And Jesus answers their question, well, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. Now, he does come. You know, prophecy, the prophetic scripture cannot be broken. This is, will truly happen. And he will come and restore all things, leading up to the great and awesome day of the Lord. That's the day when God comes to judge the earth. But he also says, Elijah has also come. And they, the religious leaders, the political leaders of Israel, they did to him whatever they wanted. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. So they understood that this Elijah-like figure came in the person of John the Baptist, who was preparing the people through repentance and confession of their sins, and the baptism which symbolizes that they've been forgiven and cleansed, to preparing their hearts to receive the Messiah. The leadership of the Jews, they rejected him, had him imprisoned and ultimately beheaded because John the Baptist would dare confront the grievous sins of those who, you know, of the leaders, of Herod, and calling him to repentance. Yes, Herod was the one to kill him, but we know, you know, there was no love for John the Baptist by the scribes and the Pharisees. And the, you know, they came to want to get the baptism, but they wouldn't come confessing their sins. And, and, and John is just going after them, saying, you know, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers who told you to run from the judgment to come. He was fiery, just as fiery as Jesus against the religious leaders. So they had him killed, and then six months later, they would do the same to Jesus. In verse 13, we have the disciples. In a very rare statement in the Gospels, the disciples understood what Jesus was saying. That Elijah was not literally going to come back from the dead, but there would be a prophet in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He has come already, and that person was John the Baptist. He has come to turn the people back to God, the greatest man who ever lived before Christ, according to Jesus. No other man beside Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit upon conception. No one else got to point out and identify and baptize Jesus, the Messiah. But because of the people's rejection, because of the Jewish leaders' rejection, the day of the Lord, the kingdom and the glory and the power won't come to them at that time. They'll need to fast forward to the book of Revelation where they're going to see another Elijah-like figure in the, in the two witnesses to prepare the way for Jesus' second return as king. So let's kind of summarize and draw some applications here. This, this transfiguration, this revealing of the glory of Christ was really for these three disciples, Peter, James, and John. It helps to them confirm to them that Jesus indeed is the Christ, the Son of God. He also gives them a preview of the glory that they will one day share in. And this motivates them to give their lives to follow Jesus, to take up their cross daily and follow him all the way to the end. Reminding them, remember, there is no glory without suffering, no glory without the cross. And all who follow Christ must follow the way of the cross. So may the glory of Christ, may it motivate us to do the work of the Lord. Knowing that one day we will be glorified just like Jesus was if we follow him through that path of suffering, path of the cross. We too will be in glory. I was thinking about this earlier this week, and I'm getting close to half my life being over. I've lived half my life, or if I lived a tube an average age almost. I don't know how it feels if you guys who are further ahead of me, you know, you've you're, you're lived three quarters of your life, or maybe you're, you think you're in your last decade or in the last few number of years, but you're closer and closer to glory. I mean, that's how a Christian thinks. We're closer and closer to glory. The glory of Christ being yours when you receive when he receives you into heaven the glory of christ you know transforming you know our weak and sick and old and, and sinful dying bodies and giving us a brand new immortal imperishable sinless body one that can worship god forever and ever and enjoy all the blessings to being with him forever and ever never get tired and never grow weary and never faint something like what jesus displayed to his disciples 
because that's what we'll have one day. So as we look at his glory, may that make us yearn for more and more to be more like him. May we also see the glory of God in his word. See, some decades later, you know, Peter writes in 2 Peter 1.16, describing this event, actually. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and when the voice born to him by the majestic glory said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on that holy mountain. See what he's, what he's saying? Look, look, this gospel, this message that we present to you, that Jesus died and was raised from the grave to, 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 to wipe away all your sins, to save you, that was not just something we came up with. This is not a myth. It's not a legend. But it's coming from this same experience that we had on that mountaintop. And all those decades later, he remembers seeing the glory of Christ, hearing the voice of God himself. And they live as a living testimony of this event, saying, you know, what we told you, it's not our own creation. But then Peter goes on to say this in verse 19, yet we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, more sure, to which you do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing first of all that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, the point that he's making here is the word of God that we have here. It's more certain, it's more sure, it's more true than even the, that mountaintop transfiguration experience verified by three other eyewitnesses. This is why Christians must not look to you know, your own personal experiences or look to within to determine what is true. I mean, I've told you it's Christian mysticism. It's looking for truth from within. And it's very popular. It kind of in, in our kind of circles here in, in, in Toronto and in, in the word evangelicalism, it kind of goes by the name of spiritual formation in today's context, kind of Dallas word stuff. But really what it is is that you're looking for truth from within yourself. You're trying to assess your own feelings and, and your experiences. You're adding all this subjectivity to determine what is right and true, how is God speaking to me within. And you're not looking at the external objective truth, which is in the word of God. Mysticism is, you know, how letting your experience be the determiner of what is true and what is right. At the same time, not being aware that, you know, your experiences or your interpretation of your experiences could be wrong. And how does this come up today? You know, I, I've heard, I used to, I mean, in certain circles, I hear a lot. People always say when you're talking, you know, well, you know, God told me this, and that's the trump card. If God told you something, then, you know, that defeats any other argument you could bring. Here, I got the word of God for you, and you say, God told me this. Well, there's not really much of an argument we can have. If you don't believe this is the truth, your experience is more true, or you thinking God telling you something is more true, that's a little dangerous. And other times, you know, you hear it it's more subtly played down, and, and people saying, you know, oh, I feel like I have real peace about this thing. This subjective feeling is, is what tells me what is true or reliable. You ever said that? You ever thought about that? No, it's just because I feel at peace about something that may be true, it might not be true, but this is true, right? So Peter, who had this transfiguration experience, validated by two other apostles, sharing the same vision, seeing the same thing, he says, the word of God is more certain and true than even that experience. So we must pay careful attention to God's word. We must let the word of God judge our thoughts, judge our feelings, judge our experiences so we can know how true they might be. The Holy Scriptures is the only thing, objective, truth spoken by God as men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
So if God's word doesn't match your experience, the problem is not with God, not with his word, the problem is with me or how I view my experience or how I've interpreted my experience. I need to change how I see myself, not change what the word of God says to fit my experience. So read and immerse yourself in the scriptures. Find out and how you can behold the glory of Christ in his gospel, in the word. Study the scriptures so you may be drawn into deeper and deeper worship. And as you read your word, you know, mark it up. Underline it, circle things, highlight things, you know. Digest them carefully so you may be careful to listen and obey what God's word says until you're transformed into greater and greater glory. You know, I mean, if your Bible is, you know, pristine, the Bible that you read, if the Bible looks like it, you just bought it out of the store, now I can be willing to bet that the person's life is probably not that pristine, right? Your life is probably, you know, you're struggling as a Christian, you're probably very weak or carnal or, you know, not very strong and mature in your faith. But if your Bible is like, you know, every page is marked up, it's falling apart because you're in it so much. I can tell you what, that person's life, that person's relationship with God is not falling apart. That person's life and walk with God is strong. And that's what we want for all of you. So if you don't know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you need to know that you're outside the gates of glory. You will not see the glory of the Lord. You only receive his wrath. Unless you humble yourself and turn away from your sin, turn away from loving yourself, from worshiping yourself, from living like you are the Lord of your life. So surrender yourself to Jesus, to trust that he died the death that you deserve on that cross, and he was raised by God the Father to give you eternal life. If you would repent of your sin, if you would believe upon Christ, if you would deny yourself, take up that cross and follow Jesus, you will be saved. And if you can see the glory of Christ in his gospel, the glory of Christ in this glorious message, glory will await you for all eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your word, which is more certain, more true than even the most majestic mountaintop experiences. Yet, Lord, we're also thankful for giving us these experiences that we can get a glimpse of what life will be like when we're with you. Pray that, you know, as we see your glory in the cross, we see your glory on Good Friday and in the resurrection, that we will be changed and conformed more and more to the image of Christ. Do this in our lives, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.